Okay. Thank you very much, Michelle and panel. Uh, again, I think every topic that we, we cover is, is really at the, the, the nub of what we're trying to talk about with sustainable tourism. We always, and they're always too short. We always want them to be longer. It's a shame. Now then, skiing. Let me just give you some background before I introduce the guest. Um, we're talking here about ski resorts, about man-made snow, leisure parks, um, and their impact on the environment. Um, I just want to give you a couple of facts. According to the European Environment Agency, the length of snow seasons in the Northern Hemisphere has decreased by five days each decade since the 1970s, thus increasing the demand for the production of artificial snow. Some ski resorts use artificial snow to extend their ski seasons and guarantee snow for every day of the season. And there are now some resorts that fully rely beg your pardon, on artificial snow. Now, the Alps has 35% of the world's ski resorts, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and around 120 million tourists come each year. Um, and for a lot of them, it just basically is impossible to continue a ski area without creating artificial snow. But, and that's why we're here, there are environmental impacts to that. Um, snow cannons, for example, do have a, an impact. And we're gonna, I'm sure you're gonna discuss all this. Um, but I'll just say one thing, which is that the CEO of Responsible Travel, Justin Francis, has actually recommended stopping ski holidays altogether, which is quite a drastic thing, but that's how extreme the argument go. Now, we have with us Loïc Bonneuil, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Compagnie des Alpes, who is now going to basically talk us through how his company is challenging this. Hello, everybody. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about those uh, essential uh, issues. Um, would it be possible to have a look at, uh, at the slides, please? Thank you. And uh, you, you've been launching uh, the debate uh, on a, a very um, appropriate way. I would like just before to, to go into this debate to give you an overview of what is Compagnie des Alpes. Uh, as, of, uh, as some of you may know, Compagnie des Alpes has two activities. Uh, half of our activity uh, regards leisure parks. We've got Park Essex and uh, it's very special for me to uh, to be here in the Museum of Romanity when you, you manage Park Essex. And uh, Futuroscope. And we have other leisure destinations in uh, Belgium, Holland, and uh, uh, Austria. And the other part of our activity is uh, ski resorts, and most of them are in the French Alps. We've got, we manage uh, 10 ski resorts, and both activities have about 10 million uh, day visitors a year. So, uh, the, the debate uh, around ski is the following one. I will mainly speak about ski here. Uh, we have actions and uh, the same actions uh, for uh, leisure parks, but I think that all of you are more interested by listening to ski, uh, as all of us know that climate change will impact this activity. So, as uh, ski is concerned, we are both victims and guilty. Victims because uh, our activity depends, rely on snow and cold, and we have all a sense that uh, this is disappearing. The question is at which pace this is disappearing. And guilty because we are part of the problem, and uh, some of us had clumsy behavior, like for example, using helicopter to bring snow on slopes, which might not be a solution or you might heard about uh, the debate right now about uh, ski reservoirs, uh, and especially in, in La Clusa, with uh, a lot of articles around that. So we'll speak about two subjects. First, uh, the victim part, and then the guilty part. So for the victim part, uh, what was very important to me when I joined Compagnie des Alpes three years ago was to understand properly at which pace climate change will impact our business. And I asked the team, what do we have around climate change? And they told me, we have everything, and they show me curves with evolution in time of the limit between snow and rain. But with that, we were clueless about the consequences for our business. And a few engineers have been working on that uh, on the past years uh, with me, and they've built a, a model, amazing one, using Meteo France data, 
and uh, they've been modeling on uh, using uh, geographical information systems uh, and uh, with two kinds of information. Uh, how will natura natural snow evolve? And do we have cold slots and enough water to produce, uh, to have some snow making? And they did that up to the end of the century on all of our resorts in two scenarios. Uh, the first one is the scenario 4.5, which is plus two degrees at the end of the century, which we hope we will follow. But it is most probable right now that we will follow the other one, the 8.5 scenario, which will lead us to four plus four degree at the end of the century. And those te teams came back to me with the kind of uh, graphic you see behind me. Uh, and well, they have uh, a lot of them, and so I just show you one of them. So you, you see a resort, it is Flen, Morillon, Sixth, and you see uh, our ski lifts, uh, which are in, um, in black. And here you have the view on the season when it's green. It means you've got enough uh, snow to ski during all the winter season. When it's orange or red, you don't have enough snow to ski during the season. And, and you see at some point uh, in the middle of the orange, you've got some green. It means that uh, you don't have enough natural snow, but if you can do some snow making, uh, you have enough cold to make some snow and to have the slopes on. So that's for the year 2000. And they've been working on slots on ranges of year, 2020 to 2040, 2040 to 2060. And for all of those years, they've got probability and they, they showed me what are the two worst years during this 20 years frame, what are the four worst years during this frame, and what is a medium year. So I'll show you how it evolves for the two worst years during this, uh, those ranges. So that's the next uh, slide. And you see <laughs> how the green is disappearing during the century. So uh, yes, our business will be disappearing. And the question is at what pace? And um, good for us at Compagnie des Alpes because we have very high resorts. And this is the lowest resorts we manage. Most of our resorts will have enough snow uh, to uh, be able to ski up to 2060. And then it becomes <coughs> difficult, and even up to 2060, there are some of them for which it's it will be more and more difficult to ski uh, during December. So if I, if I have to sum up the consequences for us, first thing is that it's not that worse up to 2060. But still, we have to adapt. And we've got to take actions as well because we're guilty and we'll come back to that. So I, I will show you some of the actions we take to adapt ourselves since we are victims in some way. And uh, to give you a very concrete example, this is what we did in uh, Les Arcs last year. We've been replacing a ski lift by a gondola. And the difference is that with a ski lift, you need to have your skis on your foot when you come back uh, to the bottom of the slope. So you need snow at the bottom of the slopes. And, you, and if there's not enough uh, snow at uh, 1,500 meters, you won't be able to have your clients uh, go back to the ski resorts, to their, uh, to their hotels, and etc. So we replace this ski lift by gondolas, which means that years where we won't have snow up to 1,500 meters, but we will have snow at 2,000, uh, uh, our clients will be able to go back. The other thing is that the beginner zone has been removed from uh, the, the start of the gondola to the high end of the gondola. And this way, we, we in 20 years, in terms of climate change, will be able to operate those be beginner zones 20 years more. And uh, last but not least, we are completing uh, the activities uh, we suggest to the clients. For example, we did a museum at 2000 uh, at the high end of the gondola. And we have uh, two uh, chill zones uh, in order to take advantage of uh, the environment. Uh, and, and that's what we need to multiply because snow won't be the only thing on which we can rely on our business later on. 
So that's for winter. And the other very important and very difficult thing is to diversify our activities on a bi-seasonal uh, offers. So we need to develop activities for summer. Right now, all ski resorts are made for winter. There are countries like Australia, Australia where they have very nice resorts uh, in summer as well. And climate change is something that will uh, trigger issues for us as regards winter, but it's a, an opportunity for us in summertime. The way we think we need to move on on uh, summer is to uh, think of uh, ski resorts globally and to make master plans of the research and try to think of activities that will be able to offer uh, a different kind of experiences to families during at least one week. And we need to have capacities. The big difference between a ski resort and summer activities is that for ski, it's, you, you, you can have a lot of capacity. For a lot of people, it's very easy. You have a few gondolas and then you can have a million skiers uh, in winter. And for summertime, uh, each activity can bear about 20,000 uh, uh, people uh, during the, the summer, so it's very low ca uh, capacity. Those activities need to be developed in a way that uh, are uh, sustainable and that preserve the environment because the environment is the raw material on which you rely for your clients. So at the moment, we are developing with local communities master plans on our resorts, and that's an example I took on uh, Grand Massif, which is a resort on which you saw uh, the uh, modelization as, uh, uh, on climate change before. And uh, we are developing activities too, uh, guiding tour, uh, and we bought last year Evolution 2 in order to gain expertise on summer activities. So that's, that was for the victim part. Now let's, let's go back to the guilty part. Since uh, we are impacted uh, by climate change, there is a huge focus on what we do in order to uh, limit our footprint on uh, the environment. Well, uh, I was very surprised and uh, well impressed when I arrived in Compagnie des Alpes three years ago because uh, I often see companies that have huge declaration on their commitments, and sometimes very few proofs. And in Compagnie des Alpes, I saw the opposite. I saw a, lo a lot of local proofs, but very few uh, global commitments for the company. Let's take an example. I gave you some example on this slide, but uh, one which is uh, very representative is that we have uh, biodiversity observatories in all of our ski resorts for years. And so every summer, we've got scientists that we pay and that goes all around our ski resorts in order to measure biodiversity, which means that we know uh, very precisely uh, the hotspot of biodiversity on our uh, resorts. And then when we have to build a new gondola, we know exactly uh, where to put the pylons in order to minimize our impact. And one of the direct consequences is that when we are uh, asking local authorities to have the authorization uh, to uh, replace a gondola. We have it very fast because uh, all of that is, is documented and we can argue when, why we decided, why we suggest to put a pylon here uh, and not there. But those local proofs, if you want to commit everybody in the company, if you want to, to speak to your stakeholder, if you want to speak to your clients, you need to have uh, a consistent and uh, uh, ambitions for your company. So we gathered all those local proofs and tried to see where we could go uh, by 2030 and came back with those three commitments. Uh, so our corporate ambition is to be zero net carbon scope one and two so far. Uh, by 2030, to be positive uh, biodiversity by 2030, and to have zero non-recycled waste by 2030. So far, we have no commitment on water because I'm not able to say, uh, knowing what I know about all use of water, if my impact is negative or positive on water. 
because I, it's very regulated when you take water from uh, rivers uh, to, uh, for snowmaking. So you do it when it's uh, possible to do it, and then the water uh, is uh, on the mountain, and it comes back to the natural environment in um, spring when it melts. So vo those are the three objectives, and I would like to focus on two of them, zero net carbon and biodiversity, to show you the work in progress where we are, and uh, well, all that we we building, we we are building it. It's uh, learning by doing. And uh, on carbon, I'll show you two graphs. The one on the left is where we were two years ago when we came with this objective. And uh, I think that uh, in yellow, you've got leisure parks, and in blue, you've got ski areas. And when we gathered all the, uh, all the projects we, are, we had on local level, we knew that we would be able to come to a zero net carbon by 2030, but that we needed to make more efforts. And then we, we took every item uh, as far as emissions were concerned, and we asked our team, what can we do to decrease uh, those emissions? And we came to uh, the new path that is presented on the right. And you see that there is one big step that is made uh, by 2024 on ski, it decreases a lot. Uh, that's because we've been replacing all uh, the fuel we are using for grooming with a recycled vegetable oil. So we do that uh, uh, next year. And so we are reducing by 60% uh, our emissions on our ski resorts, scope one and two, uh, in two years from now. So by taking every item and by having uh, um, discussions, uh, looking at innovations on every item, uh, it's possible to decrease rapidly our emissions. And at, at the end, we think that we will need to capture about 20% of uh, our uh, emissions, of the emissions we have now. And we built a partnership with uh, the French National Office for Forestry. And we are beginning to invest uh, from now on uh, local carbon sequestration in order to offset uh, the remaining carbon emission we'll have by 2030. So we are investing now to be able uh, to benefit from this capture in 10 years from now. So that's for carbon. I will show you the very preliminary work we are doing on biodiversity. Um, well, when uh, I, I talked at the beginning on biodiversity, people told me, well, carbon is easy because you can measure it. Biodiversity, you can't measure it, so we can't do anything. That's false. Uh, you can measure things, and you need to measure things if you want to have an impact. There are several items that uh, have an impact on biodiversity, and the first one as far as ski resorts are concerned, is artificialization. So what we did is that we tried to measure the artificialization of our resorts. And so we made up a scale, the one that you see below. And you know, zero is full artificialization. That's when you have concrete with a pylon. And one is full non-artificialization. So uh, by construction, this scale is false. But at least we have something, and we're discussing with the French uh, Office for Biodiversity in order to have some uh, uh, V-scale audited and be able to, uh, to use it and to recognize it. The good thing with that is that now I'm able to put some kind of figure on the level of artificialization of my resort. And from this figure, I can discuss with each of my managers and ask them, what can you do in order to decrease your artificialization at what kind of target uh, can you commit on uh, by 2013 time of desartificialization? And then you begin to talk with each of them, and they will tell you, yes, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you ride this route with your cars usually to go to uh, this gondola, maybe we don't need it. So maybe we can uh, give it back to the nature. And this way we can work on artificialization and biodiversity. Then my dream will be the, would be the next step to uh, use as well uh, the 
the map of ecosystem on our resource, which is on the right part, and to gather both informa uh, information and to say artificialization has not the same impact depending on, on which ecosystem it is. So uh, I'll go a step further and say I need to protect this ecosystem. This one has, is less rich in terms of biodiversity, so if I have to make a choice, it is the one where I need to have this artificialization. Well, so I, I, I gave you some example of zero net carbon and biodiversity. We have the same time of uh, approach on recycled waste and on water management. And this is some kind of feeling I have on the level of maturity we have on each of the item. We're not perfect. Uh, our approach are, uh, we simplify things in our approach. Uh, we um, choose so far not to go to labels because uh, there are so many labels, people don't un understand anything about labels. You don't know if it's a mean or if it's a result that you're looking. And the first thing that counts for us is uh, our results, and then we'll go to labels. <laughs> we can have a debate, and I think labels have, are over, uh, have over interests, but first we uh, wanted to concentrate on actions. So that's it, and uh, what I learned for this is, first of all, raise our knowledge. Let's understand what is the impact on climate change. Stop just reading articles that say, climate change is here, it's coming, no, we still have snow. Well, what objectively can we understand about climate change? Be consistent and try to reconciliate your local initiatives with your corporate ambitions. Learn by doing, try things, and then you'll go a step further accelerate, well, that's what we did on, on carbon, and take a long stone, and that's my belief on uh, diversification for summer. You need to invest for the long term, and in the short run, it won't be profitable, but it, in the long run, it will be. Loic, thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.